Okay, hello. Uh, I am Holly Lawford Smith. I'm an associate professor in political philosophy at the University of Melbourne, uh, and I'm a member of the LGB Alliance and the Coalition for Biological Reality, which are two groups that were formed in Australia pretty recently to fight against gender identity campaigning. And I'm super happy to be here today with um, M. Uh, who is a founding member of and spokesperson for the LGB Alliance Australia and with <laughs> Member of Parliament Louise Staley, uh, who's been an absolutely brilliant advocate for women and girls throughout this series of legal changes that Victoria has quite unfortunately introduced lately to uh, entrench gender identity ideology in the state. So uh, I'd like to start the video by inviting uh, M to tell us a bit more about herself uh, and then M and I are planning to put a bunch of questions to Louise that we've collected from members of the LGB Alliance and the Coalition. So over to you, M. Uh, thanks, Holly. And hi, Louise. Uh, so I founded LGB Alliance Australia last year with a group of others because as a young lesbian, I haven't felt represented by any of the LGBTIQA plus organisations. Uh, I'd say I've been betrayed by these organizations. Um, I've seen how harmful gender ideology and queer theory is to young people, and I've experienced a lot of it firsthand. Mm -hmm. There's immense pressure for lesbians to include males in our dating pools if they identify as trans, and this pressure is coming from within our community. Uh, I've had several friends who are meant to be my allies simply not respect exclusive same-sex attraction or the boundaries of lesbians. Uh, before last year, I'd been too afraid of the consequences of speaking out, but after seeing more and more young people being harmed by this, I decided I had to do something, no matter the consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, so this led to LGB Alliance Australia. Uh, we're one of over 15 countries who have formed an LGB Alliance in over a year, and our three main aims for 2021 in Australia will be amending the upcoming conversion uh, practices bills mm -hmm. in Victoria and Tasmania, uh, and we already passed bans in Queensland and ACT to ensure that they do what they're meant to do, which is protect LGB youth from conversion practices. Yep. At the moment, they don't protect us, and in fact, they make us more vulnerable. Um, we also want clarity regarding the Equal Opportunity Act, acknowledging sex-based exemptions regardless of gender identity, and our final goal is to protect minors from unnecessary and experimental medicalization. LGB youth are overrepresented in cohorts of dysphoric children, and without medical intervention, the overwhelming majority actually desist. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and if there's anyone watching who wants to hear more about uh, M's experiences and the LGB Alliance Australia, we're gonna do a, a full interview together soon, so you can keep an eye out for that. Okay, so over to Louise. Our first question, you gave two incredible speeches in the Victorian Parliament, uh, uh, one quite recently uh, and one a year or two ago, I think. So first on the sex health ID legislation and then more recently on conversion therapy. So we're going to link to these in the video description in case anyone hasn't seen them yet. And you can also find them on Louise's channel and uh, on a playlist on my channel. Uh, so uh, relating to that, uh, our members wanted to hear more about your motivations for getting involved in these fights. Um, why are these bills in particular something that you care about? Uh, hello, Holly. Hello, Em. Hello, everybody. I actually first spoke on a birth, deaths and marriages amendment bill back in 2016, and that bill ended up not uh, passing the council mm -hmm. and they brought it back in 2019 and so one of the the speeches you just referred to was the 2019 version of that uh, and I reread what I, I said on that back in 2016 because there isn't video of it mm -hmm. and it was really visceral as to my reaction to it and I think now I'm probably more educated on the 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 reasons, but that that original one, I, it just spoke to me that having self ID for uh, trans was bad for women because at that point it was really all about uh, women only spaces and the fights that women had been undergoing for decades mm. to uh, have those women only spaces but also to carve out various exemptions based on sex uh, to 
allow us to participate fully in society. And um, I, I, of course, am a Liberal Party MP, and um, I'm, you know, people might be a bit surprised about why I've taken such a role in this, but I don't think it's in any way incongruent. I, I just think I've always been a feminist. I've been a feminist since I was, like, you know, conscious. And uh, this just spoke to me as as wrong. And then, so that was the, the uh, self-ID in um, births, deaths and marriages. And then, of course, the, the 2019 bill went further because it allows anybody to change the sex on their birth certificate to anything mm -hmm. every year. Um, and that just seemed nonsensical to me as well. Like, I just thought that was ridiculous, to be honest. I, yeah. I, I couldn't see how the arguments that were being put forward, which were that of oh, people who are fronting up for job applications and the sex on their birth certificate doesn't match the sex that is turning up to the interview, um, this is a problem. Well, I just thought, okay, well, that's fine. Then change to at least male or female or X. Yeah. But if you're going to change to well, pan gender or something that like your average employer is going to say, what's that? I don't quite see how that's helping somebody, uh, you know, not be discriminated against. So I, th I also thought it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and then we got this bill, which is the, the um, bill that purports to outlaw conversion therapies. Mm -hmm. And the government says, oh, well, we took it to the election and and they did but they they i think what almost anybody who knew that would have thought well really what they're talking about is any practice that's trying to change somebody's sexuality yeah and um i agree with that that should not be legal you know like as i said in my remarks in the house it's also stupid because it's an innate characteristic you can't change it mm -hmm. but um even it, it, even if that wasn't it, 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 you know, it's just wrong to, and the past pre practices, which were often quite horrific, uh, should be outlawed. And, and I completely support that. But once again, this bill has then said they've gone too far. They've gone, they're in thrall in a whole lot of ways to queer ideology, which is just not helping women and girls. Yep. So two examples. The first one is the bill removes lesbianism and homosexuality generally as a protected characteristic under the Equal Opportunity Act and, and replaces it with um, gender identity. Yeah. Well, a, as I, I, I'm sitting in the bill briefing and there's all these people there from the government and I said, so let me get this right. You're going to make lesbianism a footnote in the Equal Opportunity Act. That's going to be the only reference to it in a, you know, and you think that's progressive? And they just are like, you know, they're like they don't like people like me. <laughs> um, but the the other thing of course it, it is with this idea that the gender that somebody says they are, any words, deeds, anything that does not affirm that is a conversion practice and for children and i'm sure we'll get into this with the the um bell versus tavistock uh case i mean the court has found that that children are not uh medically competent to make that that assessment and so you think therefore that the only uh response you can give to that is to say, well, then you've got to adopt the wait and see approach. Yeah. A and wait and see is not, it's not in there anymore. It doesn't, you know, it, it's got to be affirmation. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and wait and see is just not comparable like to conversion practices at all. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, that, that, I think that this is not, uh, understood by the broader community. The broader community thinks, oh, trans people have a terrible time and we have to be nice to them. And I, at the individual level, I absolutely agree with that. This is not about some personal, you know, thing about trans people. It's, it's just that if you're 
a 15 year old girl who s decides that she's a boy the path is puberty blockers hormones double so mastectomy yeah. and often hysterectomy yeah. and that's that's not reversible so if and i'm oh, sorry i left one out permanent drug dependence yeah mm. that in itself has other sort of quite bad effects in terms of bone density you know there's a whole lot of other mm. stuff that goes with it um so yeah it's not like like you can wait and see with um homosexuality like well that's fine, you know, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> you come out the other end and you're waiting to, waiting to see, and, and, you know, whatever the answer is, uh, there's no difference, you know. <laughs> uh, whereas this is, this is, like, I think, butchering girls. And uh, as I said in the House, I genuinely believe that a future parliament will give one of those historic apologies and they will pay compensation because uh, just the, the, the research tells us, you know, and relied on by um, the UK court, this is experimental and there are people who uh, they transition, there are um, a whole lot of reasons why people have gender dysphoria that need to be addressed first or in at the same time as the gender dysphoria, uh, rather than just saying, well, if we if we um, affirm your gender dysphoria, that will fix your autism, or or it will fix your you know childhood se you know sexual history of abuse, or mm -hmm. your depression, or your anxiety. Well, we have to help those those aspects as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so disappointing. I think you're probably right that we have to wait till some future time for all the legal cases to roll through, and then at least we're kind of sorry. But it's it's so sickening that all this damage has to be done in the meantime, right? Until things turn around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just think there's been when when you talk to so so parents uh, of kids, they're they're told. Um, you have to affirm or your child will kill, kill themselves. themselves yeah. Now, that is really abusive. Um, and it's not, the evidence doesn't show that either, by the yeah. way. So, uh, but I think there's all these parents who just want the best for their kids yeah. and they love their kids and they're just like, well, what do we do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. A, a very compelling set of reasons to care about, <laughs> about the issue. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, so I was always raised knowing that there's no right or wrong way to be a woman. All that you need is to be born female and then reach adulthood. And there's now this kind of conflict in the view of womanhood. Like once I believe that the only requirement is to be like born female and you can act or you can dress however you want. And the other side sort of claims that a woman is a person of either sex with a like woman identity. <laughs> Um, what do you think the impact of gender ideology and its increasing social uptake has on the rights of women, girls, and the impact on feminism? Uh, look, I think this is a really interesting question, and it's one that I um, talk to mainly my gay friends, not, not necessarily my lesbian friends, about. Um, because for years and years, of course, the way you abused a gay man was to talk about them being effeminate or to have female sort of characteristics. And it was just this, you know, awful, awful way. And, and we seem to forget that for most, you know, we have to have this, this way that we can say that a woman can be anything. Mm. And and whether you're butch or whether you're really ultra feminine, um, I, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of stuff that the, I think the academics and Holly would call an unpacking here. Um, but it, it, it goes to this idea, you know, you see plastic surgery, you see mm. the lip fillers, you see all of this stuff um, going on. And there's clearly a... Um, 
segment of the population that has got an idea about what female looks like and most of us don't look like that um mm. for you know, <laughs> and um it becomes really difficult i think when you're 12 or 13 and you're um you're on particularly if you're non-gender conforming as they now say or what we would have said was you know a little girl that likes to play with trucks and and uh you know what's her hair really short and all of that those sort of gender stereotypes mm. um for them, i mean it's hard enough being early puberty to then be to have this overlay of well maybe i'm not female maybe i'm a, you know maybe i'm a boy i mean i just think that's really um making it even harder than it is yeah it feels like it's going backwards absolutely absolutely i just feel that the particularly the second wave feminists fought for us all to be authentically who we want to be yep. and and that and then we had the waves of of um you're both probably too young for this <laughs> but you know then we had the lipstick feminists and was it okay to you know and the whole you know sort of how you present yourself and all that yeah girl power and all of that sort of thing yeah. um and we managed to to sort of learn from all of that to say well you're female because you're female you know and you're therefore and and now it just seems to me it's an it's another retrograde step um we should you know women females should be able to say who's female yeah who's women you know like surely we're allowed to do that yeah yeah i agree like as a kind of a minority class you know it's it's actually appropriation for the oppressor class to identify into yep. our class you know and also claim that we are the oppressors because we have cis privilege now and mm -hmm. no other kind of class would have this and sort of accept it like you can't be a white person and identify as black you can't be able-bodied and identify no disabled like and take those resources that are required for people to reach equity. It, it's, it just doesn't happen with any other kind of class. Mm. I mean, one thing that's really striking about that, I guess, is that so many of the people within those groups push back and refuse it, but within women, you get all these women being really kind and accommodating mm. and welcoming them in, right? So it's like yeah. feminine socialization is like fucking us within our own movement. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can't even center ourselves in feminism. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's very depressing. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that no, it is. It, it, it is very depressing that the um, political, you know, from my perspective, the, the political people who are calling this out are all on the center right. Yeah. And th that tells me that there's a great deal of fear within the, the center left because um you know the the point you made him you know that the, about people not not accepting you can have these views and mm -hmm. you know you take one look at twitter and I, in fact just before i came on here i was looking at a, a thread of um someone who was thought it was okay to put on twitter a sort of multi-part um uh explanation of what that person thought should be done to what he calls terps Mm. Yeah, you know, and it was not. It was all violent. It was all yeah. awful. Yeah, I've had multiple violent threats on Twitter <laughs> um, since kind of becoming more uh, public about my views, and yeah, and also just yeah, friendship group as well. Like there's a huge amount of kind of coercive control and sort of silencing dissent. Like um, I know that there's been multiple like Greens MPs who have been fired <laughs> or made to resign because of their mm. views on feminism. And things like that yeah well the greens seem yeah, terrified I, right like you you email mm. someone to ask their position on something and they don't even reply like they, they feel like <laughs> yeah it's like they don't know they don't know what to do and um whereas i think one of the reasons that i keep there's a whole lot i talk about this because i think it needs to be talked about mm. but i'm also really aware of how privileged I am. I cannot be deplatformed. You know, mm -hmm. I hold a seat in Parliament. I can always stand up in the Parliament and say this. Yeah. Like, people might not choose to listen to me. That's fine. 
but I, I can't have that taken away from me unless, of course, the voters of Ripon uh, decide that they, they don't want me as their representative in uh, you know, the 2022 election. But it is different for me compared to, to really most people. And I'm very aware that that gives me a responsibility to say unpopular things mm -hmm. if I think they're right, which, you know, in this case, I do. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next question. So I thought this was a really good one too. Um, so the person asks, where homosexuality is a crime punishable by death in Iran, mandatory affirmation policy, at least they are tied to uh, surgical sex reassignment, uh, is used to rid Iran of homosexuals and other gender non-conforming individuals. So this seems to uphold the gender binary and create a society at least in which everyone appears to be uh, heterosexual. So do you think this is a trend that Victoria is following? Uh, and if so, why isn't this kind of, I'm going to call it transing of the gays, uh, seen as a conversion practice mm. against homosexuals here? Uh, I hope it's not being followed here. I mean, that's all I can say. I really hope it's not. Um, I hope there are sufficient uh, progressive, moderate uh, groupings within each of the major religions and there are so you know that that are more accommodating and so if you if you want to keep your faith and yet you are homosexual you can find people who will say well you know that's fine um and be accepting of that i do i do think it's i mean i think it's terrifying over there but you know for in places like iran what, what how they've managed this it is one of the conversations that i've had with quite a few of the uh, religious leaders that I've spoken to on this bill, because of course they have serious problems with this bill for other reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I've been talking to them a as well. And, you know, I have made the point to them that, you know, the major religions in general, and certainly serious strands of them, are not really accepting of homosexuality still. and so they you know they need to sort of deal with this because the trans side of it is you know the bible doesn't talk about trans people you know it, it they're just not there that's the, that's um, a question that i had I, I sort of wonder in principle why are the, these religions more open to trans than gay but is it is it i mean that's an answer right it just wasn't yeah, there so they yeah. don't know what they should think about it yeah yeah it's scriptural yeah it's okay. scriptural um interesting that's why but uh it, it, it's yeah i i do look i would be really horrified if that sort of practice was happening in in victoria or australia it's it's coercive and it's um it's horrific it's uh you know as we talked about earlier this is not um uh without significant health consequences uh lifelong health consequences and if people were being um coerced into this to either fit in within their um, community or to um, retain the affection of their family, for example, or to be able to retain, remain within their community, that, that would just be horrific yeah. and, and must be opposed. I mean, I suppose there's a sort of, um, I don't know if I, I feel triggered by the word spectrum now, but I feel like maybe it works here. Like there's the coercive end of it, right, where it's like, they literally don't want any gays in the society. And if, and if they find any, they're going to sort of force them into transitioning, which upholds this binary, or they're going to give them the death penalty. But then there's like mm. a really weak version of that, which is like social pressure just starts pushing people away from identifying as gay or being open about being gay and towards being trans. You just get all these rewards socially for, for doing that. Or you can become a big YouTube star or or people start pestering you about you're not really a lesbian, you should be open to, to trans women with penises. Uh, so there's a version of this transing mm -hmm. the gay away that's not coercive or religious. It's just like fashionable or something or... Yeah, I, look, I think there's phenomenal confusion, to be honest, within the um, both the LGBTIQ community, but also the broader community. Yeah. Um, and that, like I, I said earlier, I just think most people, even even within um, the 
gay community more broadly, their, their reaction is pretty much, oh, if we don't affirm, people will do- kill themselves. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think they interrogate it past that. Yeah. Um, and it's only if you are, you know, a lesbian dating or you know, a, a gay man dating and you're up against your sexual orientation yeah. not accommodating to the trans, you know, I sort of world view. I mean, I, and I just think that that's like, I mean, as someone who's, heterosexual i don't have sex with women you know and and if 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 and if you're lesbian you by definition it's like it's definitional you just don't want to have sex with someone with a penis it's like i can't i mean to me that is just blindingly obvious (laughs) i mean i'm sorry i sometimes people sort of say but it's not obvious but i'm like it's so obvious which bit isn't which bit isn't (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, sort of the way I kind of conceptualize what's happening is like, on a societal level, we've kind of almost forgotten that gender nonconformity is actually really indicative of same sex attraction. Um, mm-hmm. And I think as a society, we think, oh, but they must be trans, but all of the homophobic parents still know that a gender non-conforming boy yeah. is very likely to grow up to be gay and they don't want that. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just like the homophobic parents still know which kids to kind of push towards either repressing their innate kind of gender expression or um, identifying as the opposite sex. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm not so sure about that i think that really conservative parents they do know like that i agree with you that they think if they've got a kid that's non-gender conforming they will and and they're conservative and don't like uh homosexuality they'll be like oh how can we suppress that how can we make sure that um you know little jane does ballet and does a huge has a lot of you know pink and uh you know all that sort of thing even though little jane would prefer to have a, a small john deere green truck and uh you know do something else um, i think i think you're right on that sense but i don't i i don't feel that parents are then going that next step and saying well we're, they must be trans. I, I do think uh, it's. I don't. Uh, yeah, I think they're still at the. Let's let's hope we can make sure that they they turn out heterosexual. Is is yeah. is where that that cohort is. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Like especially in Australia, there's just nothing as insidious as that sort of um, no. really sort of. Uh, religious right that is in, for example, like America and things like that. Um, I definitely agree that it's it's more kind of like an internalized homophobia that the child would sort of take on rather than mm. like actual sort of brainwashing or like torture that I've sort of seen in a lot of cases in America in like mm. Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I agree yeah. that it's it's nothing as I'm gonna say again, yeah, yeah like insidious. As yeah, that. yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I think, you know, the, the evidence shows that the two biggest uh, sort of groups, particularly of, of um, girls who uh, might identify as trans, are either same-sex attracted mm. or, or, and or autistic, yeah. you know. So the, the fact that where, you know, people are, are just, you know, you get, I just think we can't get past how terrible early years of puberty are for most people, not most, but many people, you know, and um, how confusing it can be and how, for a whole lot of reasons, people just sort of, they don't like that their body's changing, they don't they don't like the way that they're being sexualised, particularly if they're a girl. Um, Although increasingly that's true of boys as well, you know, the, 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 you know, and so I just think it just becomes, well, what can I do to 
make this pain go away mm. and who, who am I really and suddenly there's this online community that says well this is what you are yeah definitely yeah um so sort of my next question going on from that I think it kind of flows on really well is um in the UK High Court and the case of Kira Bell versus Tavistock and yeah they were the judges reviewed the evidence and they concluded that once children go on puberty blockers, they almost invariably proceed through all of the stages of transition. Mm. And that children under 16 and likely under 18 cannot possibly provide informed consent to long, long term and unknown consequences. Uh, you mentioned Kira Bell in your speech in Parliament last year. Have you seen yeah. anything to suggest that other Australian MPs are taking action on Australian approaches to treating uh, dysphoric kids in light of the Kira Bell case? Uh, no, no. I mean, Claire Chandler in the Senate has made similar comments, um, but I, I just think it, it, within Victoria, the the Labor Party has, uh, and for example, and not in addition to the Labor Party, the the various independents or crossbenchers who have said that they will vote for this bill under any circumstances, like unamended. Um, I don't think they want to look at that. They 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 don't want to think about the Bell versus Tavistock judgment. They don't want they don't want to interrogate any of this. Um, it's all just well, you Louise Staley, you anybody who opposes this are transphobic. Full stop. We, you know, don't don't interrogate why you know, anything. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the the bell the, the bell judgment was really important because it goes through in really um, clear terms why the evidence that Tavistock presented in its case to say that that uh, somebody was Gillick I able to be competent at that age. Um, and the court rejected it all really quite damningly. They said that the, the clinic hadn't collected the right stats, they hadn't asked the right questions, and they said what those questions should have been, um, and that their own evidence didn't support their case. Yeah. So given that we use Gillick competency in Australia for other things, one would have thought that would have been really instrumental here to say, well, what's going on? But no, I, they, nobody said anything. Mm. And, yeah. Um, okay, I wanted to ask you about detransitioners. So um, we had a look and there's about 17,000 users on uh, subscribe to the detrans subreddit, which of mm. course probably not all of them are detransitioners themselves, but potentially a pretty large population there talking about their experiences. This seems to indicate uh, that gender identity isn't in fact either kind of innate and unchangeable, uh, or at least that these people were misdiagnosed at some point as being trans when they weren't. So uh, I think one of our members was wondering about whether uh, minors in this position, so people who have experienced medical mal malpractice by being unnecessarily transitioned, will have any course uh, for redress in the future in Australia. And in particular, if the conversion therapy bill goes through and then the uh, service providers can cite the bill as saying that they, they had to have an affirmation only policy, uh, mm -hmm. is that gonna get them off the hook and then kind of be worse for these future detransitioners? Uh, look, I suppose the answer is I don't know. Um, it does go to the point that I made in the bill that I do think a future parliament, and I've, I mentioned this earlier, will apologise for this and, and there will be compensation. And that goes to that sort of question, but I I just I just don't know. And, and one of the problems we have in Victoria, and it's true in the UK as well, so in Victoria, you go to the World Children's Hospital, the RCH clinic, the gender clinic as a child, and you are quite likely to be on the same sort of conveyor belt that we saw in the, the Bell versus Tavistock. So uh, 
puberty blockers followed by uh, hormones, but they, they don't do surgery on uh, children under 18. Mm. And in fact, that surgery is not performed in the public system uh, you know, for dysphoria. So there's no stats. You don't know. Like, like nobody's collecting yeah. um, uh, how many people are having the various sort of interventions that you have for dysphoria. Um, and then similarly, if you've been to the, you know, you've, you've been to your surgeon and you've had, you know, however much intervention you've had, and then you tra detransition, are you going to go back to your surgeon yeah. and say, oh, look, by the way, mate, um, yeah, you just butchered me and I, you didn't ask the right questions. I don't think you are. No, and apparently some people try or they try to find, like they, they say they find it really difficult to even find surgeons or clinicians that will talk to them about detransitioning or that can manage them coming off their their hormones or whatever so it's yeah. like a an, an area that doesn't really exist in terms of expertise yet mm. um which is yeah i i feel i think that probably the heart of that question might have been that in, in normal cases when there's kind of medical malpractice and we look back on it there is a case for lawsuits because it was just the medical establishment or or people making money or you can hold the individuals accountable mm. but it's not usually mandated in law mm. that the medical pr practitioners take that approach and do that stuff so i i think maybe the person was trying to get it like does this yeah. bill exonerate those people when they've been mm. doing wrong and i don't know because the 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 question would hang on yeah. whether um, affirmation as defined in the bill, which is simply that you affirm that the person is the gender that they say they are, yeah. whether that would then extend to, like what that affirmation has to mean. And, and if you're a surgeon, does it mean you have to do these things? And I don't, that clearly hasn't been tested. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that. You know, I, I, yeah, I don't know. That's true. And actually, you remind me when you say that there is a bit built into the current wording of the bill, at least, right? That's like, lets people off if it's in good conscience or if it's according to the norms of their profession or whatever. Yeah. So it might be that a clinician, oh, I don't know what that would mean, but maybe that somehow gives a loophole for the law doesn't make you do it. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Well, I think that's right. I think it would because that part of the bill is designed to... A court, it, it is to allow practitioners to continue in some circumstances to effectively do the wait and see approach. Yes. It does, it, it, it is, that is what that is there for. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, so that probably, you're probably right. It I think probably that, would, would. I think that helps that then they could, if there are large scale practice um, lawsuits in the future, they can't say, well, we had to do it, the law made us. Because they, they were specifically given this kind of loophole yeah. to use their best judgment. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, so quite a few of the Elders and Alliance members are concerned whether lesbians rejecting the advances of trans women on the basis of being male could be criminalised under the Victorian Conversion Practices legislation or our existing Equal, Equal Opportunity Act as discrimination on the basis of gender identity. For example, if a lesbian says she's only interested in dating biological women on a dating app, um, or says, sorry, I'm only attracted to women, to a trans-identified male, could she potentially face legal consequences on the basis that she has failed to affirm uh, that person's gender identity? I don't think so. I, I, I'm pretty sure not. Um, I s thought about this uh, question a bit and I um, think that the bill is to do with people who are in either it, it probably best put as positions of authority so like whether that's the medical profession or um, the church or a school or, or um, parents of a child it's not designed I nor does it have scope over sort of interpersonal relationships like that mm -hmm. is my reading on it. Um, when I was preparing for this, and I, I felt I do think that's the answer. So I think the answer is is 
no. But gee, it'd be an interesting case, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, can you imagine? Like, like. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to see uh, a you know um, heterosexual man <laughs> deal with the fact that uh, that uh, if that were the case. Uh, who would they therefore, you know, who could they say yes or no to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another part of the bill that kind of makes me concerned is specifically with the family and violence aspect of it. Um, mm. And I guess that's kind of related to the other question, but in a more sort of specific context of, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with trans widows. Uh, so women who are married to men who transitioned late in life. And so if she was seeking a divorce from him, um, sort of, I think it's kind of built into the bill that there is that sort of domestic violence aspect if she chooses to leave rather than affirm his new identity. Is that kind of a correct reading of the bill? Um, no, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, again, it doesn't go to people's personal choices and personal, um, you know, if in that situation, I mean, we have no fault divorce in this country and this doesn't override that. You can divorce your spouse without giving a reason um, and that, that and that's federal law. So if the bill cannot override that, mm -hmm. so you could leave, yeah. Yeah. I think that might be, maybe that, that might be my fault even because I think either Nina and I or Kath and I talked about this in a video we were worried about or I, I should just say I was worried <laughs> that the example they give about the parent failing to affirm the child's sexual orientation I think no sorry no, the no, child no. Yeah. fails to affirm the the older parents sexual orientation yes. and that that could count as family violence in a kind of bullying or abuse type sense and i was worried mm. that that was like opening the door for saying well then when the wife doesn't affirm the husband's mm. being a woman or the the adult child doesn't affirm the dad's really being a woman because she's a fucking feminist and he's not a woman that mm. that could count as family violence so your answer is really interesting are you saying if there's not a, a, a plausible position of authority, it's probably not that the bill would have scope. Yeah, I also think that that, um, I think that example is one of several sort of around this that was not well thought through when okay. they put it into the, you know, like that they clearly were um, trying to come up with an example in their family violence part that was not um, uh, I, I just don't think that example works well for a whole lot of reasons, I suppose. Um, and I suspect what they're trying to get at is um, if a if a the husband, for want of a better word, um, decides to transition to be a trans woman, mm. and um, her son then built it into her for that. Mm. Well, that's going to be family violence anyway. Mm. So it's not clear to me why the um, that ma you know makes a difference. So yeah. then you've got to say, well, if, if if that's not clear, there's got to be some other reason, and it it would therefore seem to be that if the child then said well, look, I'm not comfortable with not calling you dad anymore. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to break off all contact with you. Well, I can't see how that's family violence. You're just, just moving away. But yes. so therefore it appears to be if you're not calling her, her, mm. which again goes to some of the conversations that lots of people are having with me about how this bill delves deep into families yeah. in a way that's really not appropriate yeah you know, i mean people need to work these things out yeah there we had a question that was pretty closely related to that so i think the answer is the same but it's not quite about mm. interpersonal 
um, whether you're criminalized in interpersonal settings. It was about whether groups like the LGB Alliance or maybe academics like me or mm. anyone speaking out against the ideology. No. Okay. No. Um, I think some will try that on. I think people will try that on you. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, that's not what the bill does because, for example, in the religious part of it, it explicitly says that you could, a, a minister could stand up and give a sermon mm -hmm. explaining the uh, views of that religion on, say, same-sex attraction and saying, you know, our religion doesn't accept that as, you know, and you must be celibate if you're same-sex attracted, mm -hmm. you know, which is a standard um, interpretation in a lot of Christian churches, um, you can still do that, okay. right? Okay. So that. Um, it, it, the fact you can do that would say that both of you could certainly put your views. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. okay. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That is kind of thrilling. Yeah. Um, so another kind of uh, question I have is we believe that legal changes should come as a result of following democratic principles which means hearing from all interested parties, not just some, and not suppressing contrary views by casting it as hate speech, for example. Mm -hmm. We don't think that this is how things went in the case of the Victorian Conversion Practices Bill or in the requests for submissions to the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute uh, for their version of the same bill. Uh, this was definitely not the case in Queensland, uh, which among others rejected a submission from the Coalition of Activist Lesbians. Um, the accepted reference groups all seem to follow age gender ideology perspective, while all other interested parties, like women's groups, parents' groups, medical and psychiatric health professionals, and so on, are excluded. Mm. Uh, why do you think this is, and is there anything that we can do about it? Well, I certainly think it is the case that that is what's happened. Uh, I can only speak for Victoria, but um, whether it was um, this bill or the birth, deaths and marriages bill, uh, the consultation was with the government's, uh, I think they call it LGBTIQ task force, maybe, mm -hmm. and um, uh, which is a very narrow group, extremely narrow group. and. That's one of the arguments that the churches are making now, that they were not in any way consulted on this bill, despite the fact that it has, you know, many, many clauses that go straight to religion, that are explicitly about religion. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you. People, you know, we have a system where you have consultation. And mm -hmm. the point about consultation is it's meant to happen before the bill gets to the Parliament, you know, like it should be the bill should be informed by broad consultation. Yet with these sorts of things, the best that we get out of the government is that we will consult after we pass the bill, you know, for any you know possible inconsistencies or something. It's like that's the wrong way around. Yeah. Um, and and I think the reason, you know. Part of me wants to think that the reason is that deep down that they know that people don't support this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, some don't. Uh, uh, but that's only my sort of um, react, you know, belief, if you like. I've got, I haven't got evidence for that. But it's like, well, if you really thought that this was had broad acceptance and was um, a good idea, wouldn't you have con consultation? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, like... uh, and then they sometimes they argue, oh, well, the only people it affects are <laughs> trans people. Well, that's ridiculous. It's utterly wrong. Yeah. You know, obviously wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's a real, if, you, if somebody believes that, and I sometimes wonder sometimes if they do, then that's an emperor has no clothes argument. It's just so demonstrably wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, um, it's just sort of, yeah, we're, like this is a, a, a bill that's supposed to be protecting LGB youth from conversion practices. And it's like snuck in this element of changing the definition of sexuality. 
Um, mm. And no one seems to know that this is a part of it. It's just like, how many LGBT people voted for that? How many people yeah. thought that that was an acceptable sort of clause to I, add I, I, I don't think anybody did. I mean, I really don't. I mean, I, I think people within the LGB community who were told that the government would legislate to outlaw conversion practices mm. would have thought, well, yes, that's good. And then they would have thought, yes, well, those practices are um, all the discredited ones that aren't used anymore, but it's good if we ban them and make sure they never come back. Um, and then there would have been, I think, some within the community who would have been talking about some of the religious pray the gay away mm. idea. Mm. But again, I don't think that was driving it. And... Um, and I'm sure that it was not about this. It was not about gender dysphoria. It was not about uh, people transitioning. It was about people's sexuality. Yeah, like my understanding is it was kind of a symbolic bill. Yeah. 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 Saying yeah. We abhor these practices and we're going to ensure a future where these are never yeah. sort of yeah. again. It, it, I agree with you. I think it was in that line of bills that both sides of um, uh, Parliament have put in over time. So there's been the um, uh, expungement of historical convictions for homosexuality. There's been an apology for those convictions being there in the first place. There's been a series of steps that um, the Parliament, Victorian Parliament has taken over the past decade in particular mm. to um, make it clear that things are different now yeah. for same-sex attractive people. It, I don't think it was about the, the trans at all. Yeah. No, there's like no historical evidence that there's ever been conversion practices on the basis of gender identity. They've just no. sort of lumped them together. Yeah. 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 Okay, we are at our last question, which makes us okay. absolute legends for time management because we're aiming for an hour. Um, <laughs> this is great. So um, this is about uh, the fact that there seems to be a media blackout on the dissenting mm. viewpoints uh, against gender identity ideology mm. or against any of these bills we've been talking about. Uh, and just do you understand why this is and why it's so hard to get any contrary views across? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, I think it's true that with the exception of Bernard Lane in The Australian, mm. who has sort of single-handedly kept th this issue bubbling along um, and has written several pieces Tons, on, yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, I think there's two... I think, well, I think it's really one thing with the... If you talk about, like, the Fairfax media and the Guardian, if you think about, you know, that group of media, most of their journalists are going to be just accepting of this view that we have to be nice to trans people or they will kill themselves and they, they're not interrogating the bill in any way and it's and it's sort of if you're a general political journalist or um sort of a generalist unless you're taking a massive interest in this issue yeah it's fraught you know you i mean you you get one pronoun wrong and you will be jumped upon. Yeah. Let alone, I mean, the very first time I spoke on this issue back in 2016, I quoted Sheila Jeffries. <laughs> and, well, you can see, you both laugh. You know what that means. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant at the time. I was like, oh, I don't know anything about this topic, but I'm going to do this, you know, because I believe in this. You know, like I, I sort of had a lot of innate reaction without a lot of information. Um, you signalled so, that you were a radical. Yeah, <laughs> it clearly it did. Um, yeah, and so I think people in the mainstream media who are not specialists in uh, this topic, which of course you know they're just not going to be, they are. They have enough self-preservation yeah. uh, instinct to know well it's not worth touching. It's, mm. it's not, I don't think that they're all on board with this legislation. I think it's more that 
uh, it's just not worth going there for me. You know, I, I, I do think that that's what's going on. And as a result, it adds to the lack of understanding in the broader community about the problems with this bill and, and the way this is going. Yeah, it's kind of like because um, they don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. And so it's just kind of, I think the pendulum has swung, swung too far in the opposite direction mm. Yeah, of acceptance without um, critical thinking. <laughs> well, I think that's right. And I think we saw it again last week with the changes that are proposed, well, not proposed, that are coming for the census. Mm. I mean, like, they're bad. They're bad for women. They, they are redefining uh, sex as gender. Yeah, it just means that all statistics are completely meaningless. Like, it, yeah, they don't mean anything. Well, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're at the end of our list. We're going to uh, uh, wrap up, I think. So thank you so much, Louise, for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for all the work you've been doing uh, for yeah. women and girls in Victoria. And I'm just going to uh, finish by passing over to M to give a little um, uh, information about anyone who's watching who hasn't yet joined the resistance and who wants to. Yes. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. And yeah, it's been really good to sort of hear your kind of perspective on everything. Yeah. Um, so Sister Insider on Twitter is looking for Victorian men and women to help campaign to reform self-ID. Uh, the Coalition for Biological Reality has been doing a lot of campaigning in this space, as have Save Women's Sport Australasia. Uh, there's also the Australian branch of Our Duty Group uh, for parents of adolescents uh, with gender confusion advocating for watchful waiting. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, LGB Alliance Australia. Uh, so we can be reached via Twitter, um, in multiple Facebook groups, and on our website. Um, all on the LGB Alliance Australia. Um, and I just kind of want to, yeah, sort of put this out as like a rah rah moment. Like the resistance is growing every day. Yeah. Uh, if you're passionate about any of these issues, female only spaces, women's and girls' sports, women's reproductive rights, keeping the definition of sexual orientation in the Equal Opportunity Act, and with it, the rights that we've fought for decades to have, um, you need to get involved, you need to reach out. We're stronger together, and with enough of us coordinating, we'll be able to find compromises in all of these conflicts of rights and make sure that we can carve a middle path forward. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'll list all of those groups in the video description so people can find them easily. Okay, yeah. thanks so much. Thank you all.